What's so great about Wolf Hall? Welcome to a series I sometimes do whenever I read a classic or modern classic that is really beloved and I never read it before and now I am reading it and I want to talk about it. This is the second time I've done this. First one was Agatha Christie's and then there were none, which was properly great. And then and now I, I just read Wolf Hall. Finally. Wolf Hall, 2009 Man Booker winner, the sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, which I've got here as well, also won the Man Booker in 2012, I think, and then there was the, the third one, The Mirror and the Light, which came out last year and was long-listed for the Booker Prize. In 2019, The Guardian did their list of 100 best books of the 21st century, and Wolf Hall was number one. And I've got a mate, she proudly says that Wolf Hall is her favourite book ever, so I'm like, okay, Wolf Hall. Now, I love historical fiction. Historical fiction's been a fairly recent discovery of mine in terms of favourite genres, and I've read quite a lot of historical fiction, and I've done a few videos on the historical fiction that I really like. Most of it, I prefer it to be kind of gothic, and scary even, and Wolf Hall is not that, it is Tudor. I don't really need to tell you what Wolf Hall is, you probably know. Question is, what do I think is so great about it, if anything at all? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about Wolf Hall, a hell of a lot of thoughts, so let's dig in. In case you don't know what Wolf Hall is, what's it about? Wolf Hall is Hilary Mantel's take on the Tudor world of Henry VIII. It is a sympathetic, biography of Thomas Cromwell, who was one of Henry VIII's great advisors. He rose up from pretty much nothing. The book depicts his childhood as the most depressed and vile and miserable world, only for him to become a soldier, sort of a mercenary soldier, who returns to England and becomes a lawyer, and he rises up, he's educated, he can read the entire New Testament in Latin, and eventually he finds his way into the court of Henry VIII and becomes his most trusted advisor. It's kind of like Jesus. You know how we all know the uh, nativity, you know, Jesus was born in the stable in the manger and we get his birth, everyone knows the birth of Jesus story and then no one knows what Jesus did until he was like 30 and then he pops up and he's a prophet and he tells people how to live their lives, whatever. This is kind of similar. You get the first chapter of this book is Cromwell being beaten and abused by his drunk blacksmith father and his sister who's married to this nice Welsh guy. They are trying to kind of treat him right and look after him as best they can, but then he hops on a ship and goes to be a soldier. And then we don't really know anything about him until he is now a lawyer. And he's a lawyer who, one of his clients is Thomas Wolsey. And Thomas Wolsey was one of Henry VIII's advisors as well. He was a member of the clergy. And we pretty much pick up the story where Thomas Wolsey is kind of our protagonist. And Thomas Cromwell is the eyes that we see the world through. And for a a lot of the first part of this book. It's Henry VIII meeting and getting to know Anne Boleyn and trying to figure out how he can get divorced and then married to her. What the, the, the narrative of Wolf Hall and the Thomas Cromwell perspective and the way that Thomas Cromwell kind of rises up really slowly throughout the novel, what that really reminded me of was two things. One was Vice, the film Vice starring Christian Bale as Dick Cheney, uh, the, the film that kind of pulls apart the life and work and philosophy and behavior of Dick Cheney. And when I really, really saw it most clearly was with uh, Donald Rumsfeld, where in Vice, again, I don't know much about Dick Cheney uh, other than the film Vice, but in that you've got Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney quietly kind of working under him and learning the nuances of the White House and the presidency and slowly rising up into power until he eventually surpasses Rumsfeld and Rumsfeld becomes obsolete. It really reminds you of that, with Thomas Wolsey being, in a way, our central character who leads us through this world and teaches us how the lords and the gentry and the crown and the politics and the war and everything works in, in Tudor Britain. Only for Cromwell to quietly be rising up and gaining power, gaining influence, meeting people, influencing people as he goes. And it also reminded me of Hamilton. Hamilton is a play that refocuses the narrative of the Founding Fathers to hone in on what Alexander Hamilton accomplished, when usually, up until the release of Hamilton, his story had taken a back seat to the other Founding Fathers who were deemed more impressive in terms of what they did with their lives. This is very, very similar to those two things, so if you like Vice and you like Hamilton, you're gonna like Wolf Hall. Very, very similar. So Wolf Hall follows Thomas Cromwell's life. Not completely. 
In fact, his entire life, as far as I know, is is captured by all three of these books together, and I'll have to read Bring Up the Bodies soon. Wolf Hall is historical fiction. If you like historical fiction, you're gonna like Wolf Hall. What requires more of a focus and more of a celebration surrounding it is actually Hilary Mantel's writing. Her approach to narrative, her approach to dialogue and character writing and setting and events is what really makes this novel stand out. I'm very curious as to how and why she decided to write the story of Thomas Cromwell. Why that? Why she decided to turn that into three massive 600 plus page epics. It's it's interesting why she managed to do that, but what I find far more interesting than the story and the characters is how they are portrayed, how she writes this stuff, how she writes the world of the book, how her book is structured, how the narrative works. That's the real success of Wolf Hall is Hilary Mantel. No one else could have done it the way she's done it. If anyone else had done it, it wouldn't be The Guardian's favourite book ever. It's what she did. So what did she do? Well, when Wolf Hall begins, the opening chapter of him as a young teenage boy being beaten black and blue by his horrible, abusive, sadistic father, it really sets a very clear narrative tone that is hugely misleading. And I like that. When I read the first chapter, I've, I've tried to read this book a bunch of times. I started reading it about a year ago, then about six months ago, and now I finally got through it. But each time I started it, I actually got really excited by this opening chapter because it had very enthralling and visceral language behind it. The way that his father's dialogue was written is brash and crass and cruel, and it has very, very descriptive textured language. And all of that is true of the book, but it isn't as straightforward a narrative as the first chapter has you believe. It sort of opens up like a flower, but like kind of a really surreal flower. And I found that really endearing. Basically, the book starts off pretty simple, and it actually becomes more narratively complex as it goes. As Wolf Hall builds and builds and builds, it kind of reminds you of the Song of Ice and Fire books that Game of Thrones is based on, where every chapter follows a different character and you really have to keep a close mental eye, maybe even write a little checklist off in, in your head of where all these characters are and what they're up to. This book kind of does something similar where you are always following Thomas Cromwell, but that's not always clear because Cromwell, one of the first things I noticed and it carries on all the way through the book, one of the strangest things that Mantel does with his character is she barely names him. So for example, you'll have a paragraph describing what Thomas Wolsey is up to and it will say he. It'll say Thomas Wolsey did this, blah, blah, blah. Then he did this, then he did that. Next paragraph refers to he again, but this time that he is not Wolsey. It's Cromwell. She never calls him Cromwell, and so it can be very, very confusing who is now the central focus. And you have to keep an eye on whether the paragraph has shifted. If we're in a new paragraph and he is now talking, he is Cromwell. It's such a fascinating move for her to make. Occasionally, to clarify, Mantel will write, he, comma, Cromwell, comma, did something. He, Cromwell, did this. And that's the only bit of clarification you get and you don't always get it. And it almost feels like the way that the Bible describes God with the capital H, he, him. Very, very interesting move. And that immediately sets up an expectation for the reader to try a little harder. Every time we read and enjoy or don't enjoy a book, half of it is down to the author and the other half is down to us. Did we connect with this book? Did we put in the effort to enjoy this book? Were we in the right headspace when we read it? Is it our kind of book? And so I quite often find that when we're critiquing books, we are also critiquing ourselves as readers because we're doing half the job. And Mantel seems to be expecting us as readers to put in the legwork when it comes to reading this book and keeping focus. And this expectation grows beyond that when we flit so quickly from place to place. There are sub-chapters. The chapters themselves in this book are huge, 50 to 100 page chapters. And within each chapter are so many sub-chapters, and many of those sub-chapters will start with a specific date, maybe a month or a very specific day. These jumps can be huge. They could be a few days, weeks, months, even a year. And you have to bear in mind, where is Cromwell now? Who is he talking to? Who was this person? Everyone in this book is called Thomas for a start. And these are real historic figures. And so, of course, Thomas was a popular name at the time. But it's, it's interesting the amount of legwork you have to keep putting in 
in order to keep focus. Mantel also expects us to know a little bit of history. She gives us enough background to these characters and enough details in terms of what their job is or their position is, or maybe their family background, where they're from, that kind of thing. But it's not always enough. You do occasionally think, maybe I should look this up. So I spent a lot of time on Wikipedia, going down a little Wikipedia rabbit hole, trying to figure out who these people are, because Tudor England is not my specialty. And at times you feel like it really should be. But also, it is kind of like fantasy novel world building. You really kind of feel like you're reading a fantasy novel. It's remarkable how similar this is to something like Game of Thrones, and I know Game of Thrones was based on things like the War of the Roses, but as I said, I'm not an expert, so if you're not an expert, then rather than Game of Thrones feeling like the War of the Roses, the War of the Roses, Wolf Hall, Tudor England, these things feel more like Game of Thrones to you. It just depends on where you're coming from and what you've read and what you're history schooling was like. So for me, this feels like a fantasy novel. It has all the politics, the world building, backgrounds of war, kings being nasty and underhanded, religious iconography being twisted around, and scriptures and law being rewritten. It's so much about politics, laws, religion, geopolitics, trade. It's all in there, and it's all in things like Game of Thrones. So it's amazing how much, if you come from a more fantasy background than historical background, if you like, in terms of your reading, how much this really does feel like a fantasy novel. It's also the exact size of most fantasy novels, about 650 pages. It's a fantasy epic, except that it's kind of real. And that's really, really endearing. What makes Hilary Mantel's writing elevated even more is something that I actually, I read and I very much agreed with, I can't remember who the critic was, was talking about how the writing is hugely lyrical while being massively grounded. And it's amazing how true that statement is. The writing in this book is almost fluffy in its poeticism, its lyricism. It is, it is beautiful, it is ethereal language at times. You get these little philosophical bites here and there, where suddenly Cromwell or Mantell or another character will just spout some beautiful philosophical idea or a line of poetry that feels like it was ripped from one of Shakespeare's sonnets. And yet, the events that those lines are within are very grounded, they're very real. There might be some talk amongst a table of lords who are dealing with edicts and laws and changes in policy, and some philosophical musing will come out, or a description of a bit of food, and oh, it's so pretty and ethereal and gorgeous language. But the surroundings of that language, the setting of that language, is real and it grounds it and it keeps it glued to the floor. And so how Hilary Mantel manages to juggle fluffy poetic language with very real and rigid world building and setting and structure is absolutely fantastic. She also breaks convention constantly. She's always breaking rules with this book. The he thing that I talked about, how Cromwell is sometimes not Cromwell but merely he, and you have to assume that the he in question is in fact Cromwell, that is kind of breaking rules. That is not good practice when it comes to writing, but the better of a writer you are, the more rules you can break. I remember teaching a class once where a student asked me why we use the punctuation we use and how we use it and how these rules came about, etc. And I remember referencing Cormac McCarthy, who doesn't use quotation marks in his writing. And a lot of modern writers don't. Sally Rooney doesn't, Brian Washington doesn't. But in order to break that rule of using quotation marks in your dialogue, you have to know the rules in the first place. And Hilary Mantel is clearly a master of these rules and is able to break them willy-nilly. Another thing that she does is sometimes actually move the narrative into the second person. Very rarely, but all the way through the book, maybe once every hundred pages or so, an entire thick paragraph that takes up maybe half a page will be written in the second person. It will describe you all the way through, as if you, the reader, are suddenly Thomas Cromwell. That doesn't make a lick of sense. It's clearly describing Cromwell, but it's suddenly you. Not him, not I, you. Why? Doesn't matter why. It's somehow brilliant, and I think that Hilary Mantel daring to break these rules, or not even daring to, just it almost seems like she does it because she fancies it. I kind of love that. And she doesn't just do it with the second person, but also the first person. Occasionally, we're in Cromwell's head. Occasionally, actually very, very frequently, there are lines of dialogue spoken that aren't spoken. They're certainly not in quotation marks, but they're clearly supposed to be said out loud between two characters, and yet they're not in quotation marks, 
but they're also definitely not in the character's head either. Obviously, there are moments where a character thinks something during a conversation, so that bit isn't put in quotation marks. You know how this works, every writer does this. But sometimes it is definitely spoken out loud by a character, but it's not in quotation marks, and it doesn't make any sense. And again, it's clearly not a mistake, it was clearly a choice that Hilary Mantel made. And I don't have a problem with it. I think it was kind of ballsy, I think it was kind of interesting. And it seems like she sometimes breaks these rules because she knows how they work, she knows that breaking them will create some kind of variety to the language, a little bit of flair to the way that it works. And it, it's absolutely fantastic. The way that she moves from setting to setting, scene to scene, place to place, time to time, over and over again, constantly, without a care for whether you, the reader, can keep up, that takes guts, that takes confidence, and it also shows a level of respect for you. She knows that you can keep up if you try. She knows that you will understand who these people are regardless of how much she describes them or how much background she gives. She knows that you can keep up. She's got other things that she wants to do right now with her narrative and her characters, and she gets on with that. And she trusts you, the reader, to put in the other half of the legwork. And I love that. You don't often get books that respect the reader to a point where the reader has to do their job as well. This is not a book that you can relax with. However, I did find myself sometimes zoning out. Occasionally, the language would be so weighted and heavy or too flowery, or a scene might even seem almost surreal, like a family will be sat around a table and I can't keep up with who's talking or what they're talking about or where they were before or why they're here now or what they're planning for the next day. And I'm so confused that as I'm reading, I start to zone out and think about simpler things like what I'm gonna have for dinner or the fact that I have to do the dishes. And then when I come back into the scene, I find that two or three pages have gone by with me thinking about something else and it doesn't really matter. And so I just move on. And it's like I'm having a conversation with Mantel where she says, you made that choice. Well, you zoned out. Now you're gonna have to keep up. Are you gonna go back? Are you gonna read it again? And I say to her, no, I'm gonna carry on. And if I can't understand, maybe I'll go back. But I never did at any point. If ever I zoned out, okay, maybe that's her fault. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's both, maybe it's neither. I'm just gonna move on and I move on and everything's fine. And there are definitely types of scenes and types of conversations that hold your attention more. The very first time that Cromwell and Henry VIII have a conversation, oof, it is fantastic. It is a wonderful game of chess. It is a push and pull where Cromwell realizes that Henry is not the kind of guy that you back away from. He remarks the fact that if he retreats away in fear in this conversation and acts reserved and doesn't speak his mind, Henry will push further and suddenly Cromwell will be on the floor and Henry will be standing over him. Cromwell will become a victim, prey to Henry. And so he doesn't. He pushes back and he says things that a man of his station shouldn't say and Henry respects him for it. And this is such a colossally beautiful scene. Absolutely fantastic. And there are more scenes like that as the book goes. Anne Boleyn is also a fantastically written character. She's sharp and fierce and witty, very savvy. She and Cromwell have wonderful banter, and especially around the middle of the book, the banter between them just escalates so much, it's gorgeous. Also, this is regarded as a sympathetic biography of Cromwell, where it depicts him as a very, very morally complex but ultimately good person, and I think that's really refreshing. I don't know enough about Cromwell to know if that is true to his life, true to history, or whether it is rebellious in some way. I don't actually know, but I enjoyed it. I hugely enjoyed it because I guess in a world of so much political intrigue and backstabbing and things being very unpredictable, especially Henry VIII being famously unpredictable ruler, it's great to have someone who's a little bit more stable and grounded and who's quietly moving up. Like I said, it reminded me of Vice, it reminded me of Hamilton, the focus on a more background character, someone who rises up slowly, watching the world go by, listening to other people, a wallflower almost, but never enough of a wallflower to be ignored. He's always there, he's always present, like a statue. You know he's in the room and he'll speak when he needs to, he stays quiet when it might be risky to do so, and Mantel manages to balance this kind of a character all the way through the book, relentlessly. How she manages it is astonishing. She just manages to avoid making Thomas Cromwell dull. He's almost boring. In certain chapters, he feels very, very almost boring, especially chapters that have a massive focus on people like Henry VIII or Thomas Wolsey. There are moments where Cromwell is an afterthought. He's a background figure. He's still kind of the eyes we're looking through, but he never quite falls into that boring character mire. 
He never falls into that. He always just remains interesting enough. I think what really helps is the fact that the book focuses on his family. We get a lot of his sister and her husband at the beginning, and as the book goes on, we get more and more about Thomas Cromwell's wife and what happens to her and his children, who are a great troop of characters. They feel like a rogues gallery of people. They're very interesting and he has huge respect for them and love for them and he treats them like adults and he wants the best for them. And I think occasionally every, say, four sub chapters, you know, we're moving from like the courts to the streets, to, to business, to international relations, to the household. And it goes down into the household, into his home, and it focuses on the place where Cromwell and his family live together and they sit around the table and they talk. And of course they talk about the court, they talk about Henry, they talk about Anne Boleyn, but they also just talk about themselves. There's a lot of talk about studying Latin and Greek and, and, and how they're growing up and it's kind of beautiful. It, again, it's grounding. And in those chapters, in those sub-chapters where we focus on the family, there is less flowery language, less flowery dialogue, because there are more typical, ordinary, not working class, but certainly not gentry kind of a family. And that really helps just quiet and calm everything down and letting it breathe. It's such a wonderful book. Man, what's so great about Wolf Hall? Everything. But what's greatest about Wolf Hall is Hilary Mantel. There's more that I want to say. I could keep going. This video could be an hour long. I could keep talking about Wolf Hall. And I almost don't want to stop in case I regret something I missed. But what's really great about Wolf Hall is Hilary Mantel herself. The rules that she breaks. The way that she chooses to describe settings and scenes and characters. The respect that she gives to the reader is something that I really enjoyed. She really gives us half of the book. We are building half of this book with her. Just like when you read a fantasy novel and it's up to you to picture the world, picture the costumes, picture the scenes, picture the drama, Hilary Mantel is doing that, but with actual historical figures. She is giving us trust and patience to do half of the work. And if you do do half of the work, in a kind of DIY build wolf hall with her kind of a way, it really pays off. And that, again, the language is what really sells it to me. This is such a beautifully written book. She breaks rules left, right and centre when it comes to dialogue, scene setting, timelines, grammar and punctuation. She breaks these rules over and over again. She discards them. I don't think break is even the right word. She doesn't even consider the rules. She, she sees them and she throws them out before she's even opened them up to take a look. She just doesn't care. I really enjoy that because that creates a sense of real uniqueness. There is nothing I've ever read that feels like this. And this is also the first Hilary Mantel novel I've ever read. And I'm going to read Bring Up the Bodies and I'm going to read more of her books. I'm going to read her essays, Mantel Pieces, which is such a great name. I can't resist now. Her, her writing has gotten into my head. Her voice is in my head and I want it to stay there. So what's so great about Wolf Hall? Man, everything. Everything is great about Wolf Hall. As someone who loves historical fiction, I was always going to love this book. And the hype frightened me. And the length of it frightened me. I really struggle to read books that are over 500 pages these days, because I have so many books to read and so many reviews to do and blah, blah, blah. This book, it held me. And if I miss deadlines or I don't get things done, well, it was worth it for Wolf Hall. It really is as good as everyone says. What's so great about Wolf Hall? Everything. Everything I mentioned and everything I haven't mentioned that I wish I had time for. Great book, great writer, what a legacy. All right, if you've read Wolf Hall, tell me about it in the comments. If you didn't like it, I'd love to know why. I can sympathize. If you loved it, tell me why. And subscribe for books.